everyone, I'm Megan Sullivan and welcome to this History and Games episode on Immortals Phoenix Rising, developed and published by Ubisoft. Today, we're going to talk about one of the game's main characters. No, not Phoenix, although they're pretty cool too. I'm talking about the Titan Prometheus, one of the game's two narrators and Phoenix's biggest advocate. We'll talk about who and what he is in the game, as well as his importance to the ancient Greeks in real life. And don't worry, there are no major spoilers for Immortals Phoenix Rising in this episode. So in the game Prometheus is the player's guide to the world of Immortals. He tells the story of the mortal hero Phoenix to his cousin Zeus in an attempt to convince the father of the gods that the only way to defeat the newly escaped titan Typhon is to trust in mankind. It's Prometheus' hope that by helping Zeus, Zeus will free him from his captivity on a mountaintop, a punishment for stealing fire for mortals. Now, Zeus isn't convinced puny mortals can help in the fight against the titans, but he agrees to listen to Prometheus' story while occasionally chiming in with some witty or goofy remark. And I have to say, Zeus and Prometheus' banter is the highlight of the game for me. It actually reminds me of the old WWF commentary team of Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan, where Gorilla was the straight commentator and Bobby's job was to make snarky comments the whole time. What, nobody remembers that? Anyway, it's a great dynamic and a fun way to introduce the troubled relationship between the Olympians and the Titans. But what's the real story behind the dynamic? Let's find out by taking a closer look at the legend of Prometheus. The story is told or alluded to by several authors in antiquity, including ones like Pausanias and Apollonius of Rhodes, but there are three main sources where we get our information from. Isiod, a farmer and poet from the 8th century BCE, Aeschylus, the author of the 5th century tragedy Prometheus Bound, and Plato, who of course is famous for recording the Socratic dialogues a century later. Now there's also iconographic evidence art of Prometheus's tale, and there's the possible pre-Greek origins of Prometheus, which are either Caucasian, as in literally from the Caucasus, or from the Middle East, in the form of an ancient Sumerian belief. But today we're just going to focus on the legend itself, so we have a better understanding of the actual history moving forward. The tale of Prometheus, or Prometheus, goes something like this. Prometheus, which means forethought, is the son of the titan Iapetus, which means piercing, and either the goddess Themis, the personification of divine order, Clymene, the goddess of fame and renown, or the goddess Asia. It's a little confused. The literary sources do agree that Prometheus was brilliant and cunning, and had the ability of foresight, which allowed him to see the future. It was this foresight that allowed him to glimpse the outcome of an upcoming war between the old gods of Greece, the Titans, and the new gods of Greece, the Olympians. Prometheus saw that Team Olympus was going to win, which is why he wisely got on the winning team and assisted Zeus and the Olympians in their efforts to overthrow the Titans. Because of this, Prometheus was in good standing with the new Olympic pantheon, until mankind appeared on the scene. Prometheus really liked mortals and was a steadfast ally right from the beginning. He gave them wisdom and showed them how to use fire, but the details of how he went about doing these things vary. One of the most widely accepted stories throughout antiquity was that Prometheus made man out of clay and water, specifically clay and water from, quote, Panopios in Phokis, after which Athena breathed life into this new creation. In Aeschylus' play Prometheus Bound, the Titan then takes credit for teaching mankind every sort of skill associated with intelligence and civilization, including mathematics, astronomy, sailing, medicine, the yoking and bridling of animals, and divination. He even took away their ability to foresee their own deaths by placing, quote, blind hope in their hearts. However, in Plato's version of the story, found in the Protagoras dialogue, the gods made man out of earth, fire, and other elements, and charged Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus, or Epimetheus, which means afterthought, to equip both animals and man with features that would allow them to survive. Unfortunately, Epimetheus was in charge of distribution and was so enthusiastic in dealing out cool things like claws and feathers to other animals, he forgot to leave anything of value for man. When Prometheus saw his brother's mistake, he realized he had to fix it ASAP, and decided the best way to give mankind a fighting chance was to give them fire and knowledge, both essential for survival. Thus, he stole these things from the gods Hephaestus and Athena respectively, and gave them to mankind. The poet Isiod claims the fire was smuggled out of Olympus in a fennel stalk, although potentially for a different reason. 
You see, the ancient Greeks credited Prometheus for teaching them how to make sacrifices to the Olympian gods, which apparently involved a bit of trickery. Instead of giving the gods the tasty flesh and innards of a sacrificial animal, humans offered up the inedible bones, which were wrapped in glistening, delicious-smelling rolls of fat. Isiod claims the idea came from Prometheus, who wanted to see if he could trick Zeus into taking the worst part of a sacrifice instead of the best. Now, apparently Zeus wasn't actually deceived, but went along with a ploy so he had an excuse to punish humans for their impudence. He did so by taking fire away from mankind, which was needed to cook the sacrificial meat. Perhaps feeling guilty for his part in the trickery, Prometheus then stole back fire and returned it to the humans. But whether he stole it or just stole it back, Zeus was furious by the brazen theft and decided to punish both Prometheus and mankind for this transgression. In Isioid's cynical and quite frankly misanagistic take on the story, Zeus decided to punish man by creating a terrible new evil that would plague him forever. Woman. Specifically, a woman named Pandora. Now, since most of you already know the story of Pandora and her infamous box, although it was actually a jar, not a box, but never mind, I'm not going to go over it here since unfortunately we don't have time to cover it in depth. But let me know if you want me to do an episode on Pandora's box, because there's a lot more to the story that I think most people realize, and it's absolutely worth a closer look. At any rate, Zeus had a much more severe punishment in store for Prometheus. In Prometheus Bound, Zeus has the personifications of Force, Bia, and get this, God of War fans, Strength, Kratos, or Kratos, drag Prometheus off to the Caucasus and help chain him to the top of a mountain, where Prometheus would be exposed to the elements while having his immortal liver eaten out by an eagle every day. It was a harsh punishment, one only rescinded once Prometheus agreed to use his gift of foresight to help Zeus avoid a certain prophecy. This prophecy claimed that like his father and father before him, Zeus was in danger of having a son that would one day be greater than himself, which meant the son could usurp Zeus's role as king of the gods. In Prometheus Bound, the Titan reveals that the beautiful goddess Thetis is the one who will produce a legendary son that will far outshine his father. FYI, that son turned out to be none other than Achilles. Upon hearing this, Zeus immediately gave up his pursuit of the lovely goddess and agreed to let the hero Itocles, Hercules, free Prometheus from his chains, an event which was most likely the subject of Aeschylus' lost play, Prometheus Unbound. By the way, there is another version of the story that claims Prometheus was finally freed when Chiron, Chiron, the wise centaur and tutor of many heroes, ended up on the wrong end of a poison arrow and agreed to give his immortality to either Eurycles or Prometheus in exchange for a way out of his eternal agony. Whichever way the story goes, though, and it wouldn't be surprised if there's like a billion other versions of it I missed, in the end Prometheus is freed from his torture. Plutarch names no less than at least two locations for his final resting place, one being in Argos in the Peloponnese, and one being in Opus in central Greece. You see, though mankind supposedly ended up suffering for it, the ancient Greeks were grateful to Prometheus for his gift of fire, especially the ancient Athenians, who had a festival in his honor and, according to the second century travel writer Pausanias, also honored the Titan with a torch race where participants had to run from Prometheus's altar at the academy to the center of Athens without letting their torch go out, otherwise they were disqualified. It's also said that because of his association with clay, Prometheus may have been honored as a patron of potters. The ancient Greeks even told tales of his son Thecoleon, who in some stories ended up being the ancient Greek version of Noah. But that's a different story for a different day. At any rate, now you know the legend of Prometheus. Cool, cool, but what about the actual history of Prometheus? The origins of this ancient tale of forbidden fire? Well, it's a real cool story, and we're going to discuss it in the next episode, so stay tuned. Questions, comments, suggestions? Hit me up on Twitter at M-E-G-H-A-N underscore I-G-N. Email me at M-E-G-N-H-I-S-T-O-R-Y at gmail.com and or let me know how you feel on Instagram at Celtic underscore Queen underscore Meg. And if you like this video and want to support history and games, please, please, please do so by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash M-E-G-H-A-N-R Sullivan. Thanks so much for watching, guys. See you later.